podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only Good afternoon. Mode. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Tamara Bingham Noyes. I'm the Director of Business Development here at Center for Change. We're so happy that you're able to be with us today for our webinar. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things uh, quickly before we get started, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Robison. Uh, you will see that you have a GoToWebinar um, toolkit on the, either the side or the bottom of your screen. You're welcome to submit questions in the questions pane in that toolbar, um, and we'll keep an eye on those throughout the presentation, and then at the end we'll, uh, we'll save a few minutes for some questions at that point. A copy of the post-test is in the handouts pane in the toolbar. You're welcome to, to view that or print it um, to review during the webinar. Dr. Robison is going to go over those questions as well. However, just keep in mind that the test must be taken online in order to receive CE credit. In that same um, handouts pane is a copy of the PowerPoint slides, uh, and you're more than welcome again to, to open that up and follow along um, with that and print it out and take notes if that's what you need to do. At the end of the presentation, the webinar program, GoToWebinar, will, will have a pop-up and will ask you to complete an evaluation of the webinar. If you'd be so kind as to just take one minute to complete that questionnaire, that would be really helpful to us. That's a continuing education requirement for us on our end, and we gather that anonymous data and send it back to the webinar um, accreditation bodies. So if you take a minute to finish that at the end of the webinar when that pops up, that would be great. And then about an hour after the webinar ends, you'll receive a, an email, a separate email with a link to take the online test. You click on that link, it takes you to the test site, then you take that test, and when you pass at 80% or greater, then the test site, it's called Class Marker, will automatically download your certificate of completion. Sometimes that goes to your downloads file. So if you don't see it at the bottom of your screen, please check your downloads file. It should be there. Um, I'll go over these instructions again at the end of, end of the webinar, but for now we're going to go ahead and get started. So I'm going to turn the time over to Dr. Robison and let him introduce himself, and then we'll get into the PowerPoint. Thank you. Thanks, Tamara. Hi, I'm Reed Robison, Medical Director here at Center for Change. Thanks for listening. I'm just going to jump right into it, but a note before I do is that you'll see as we go that a few of the slides uh, have missing pictures, and for that reason, I've got another copy of them online that you can access later, so if the, uh, if the holes in the PowerPoint uh, bother you at all, don't worry, you can find it all at that link, tinyurl.com slash webinar CFC, and any questions, feel free to email me. I'd love to hear your thoughts, questions, comments, uh, collaboration ideas, uh, and just to keep in touch in general. But I like to start uh, sometimes at taking a look back at what eating disorders or disordered eating has looked like through the ages as kind of a window into the struggling soul through the lens of culture. And so if we look way back to ancient Rome, or even before that, to African tribes where in times of famine, parents, like parents do, would sometimes divert their food to the kids. And there, there seems to be, as we see in certain eating disorders like anorexia, there seems to be a subtype of individual who, after they start dieting or fasting or restricting food for whatever reason, it's much harder for them to resume and bounce back from that. And that was seen in some people who uh, couldn't resume eating after prolonged fasting. Um, there are early uh, examples of purging in ancient Rome after lavish feasts uh, before knowing that these things could become habits and spin out of control. But what I find really interesting is uh, in early Catholicism, there was this idea that abstinence from food was a holy practice and was to be practiced daily and denying yourself of food made you holy uh, and there was uh, fasting as a way to rid oneself of sin um, and I'll talk about an example of that on the next slide um, there's a book if you'd like to dive into this a little deeper there's a book called holy anorexia that I like uh, by an author named Bell um, and then uh, Later, in the 1800s, there was this phenomenon of uh, fasting girls of the, of the Victorian era where 
there were these girls, often uh, early adolescents or, or pre-adolescents, who were sensationalized by the media because of their ability to go without food for long periods of time. Uh, groups of people would come to their homes and watch. They would send doctors to verify, and uh, and the media would just uh, blow this out of proportion. And it uh, became dangerous for many. There were some cases of uh, of death and uh, and really uh, tragic consequences that resulted from this. Uh, but going back to the early Catholic Church ideas, um, an example I think that's interesting is this St. Jerome uh, individual who focus, focused his teachings on how individuals in the church, especially women, uh, should live their life by denying themselves of food and other worldly pleasures. And he said things like, excess eating is the mother of lust, a belly that is distended with food and saturated with Droughts of wine is sure to lead to sensual passion and things like I desire to put off this hated body. Uh, so you can see uh, you can see the the toll that this might take on certain uh, individuals' uh, body image and eating habits. Uh, and so fast forward hundreds of years later, you have this uh, gal by the name of Saint Catherine of Siena, who is a patron saint of Italy, and she used starvation like. Uh, many did back then to demonstrate their religious devotion. In fact, at age 11, she started eating, uh, well, fasting three times a week. And by age 15, she was eating only uh, bread and water for the most part. Uh, but then a, a life stressor came along and she was 15. Her sister died in child, childbirth and her parents wanted her to marry her sister's widower, who was not a, not a good guy. So she fasted in protest uh, and did not marry but the fasting just uh, got even more out of control. And you could see the conflicted uh, views she had of this uh, in this quote below where she said, I say it to you in the sight of God that in every possible way I could, I always force myself once or twice a day to take food. And I pray to God that he will grace me in this matter of eating so I may live like other creatures if this is his will. And um, so she was fasting in religious devotion and, and in protest, but uh, she got beyond the point of return and eventually, at age 33, died of starvation. And uh, so later on, we have an example that I found interesting in the 1700s. A Yale professor started studying more and more, 14 hours a day, sleeping four hours a night, uh, and decided that food just slowed him down, dulled his intellect, took time to make and eat. So he restricted himself to 12 mouthfuls per meal. Uh, and about once a day, and did this for months, his weight was dropping to dangerous levels. He was taken home by his father. A doctor uh, prescribed a bottle of wine a day and food and banned any studying, and he bounced back from that, thankfully. In the late 1800s is where we found the term anorexia for the first time. It actually showed up in the DSM version 1, in uh, the category of psychogenic disorders. At first, it was under the subheading of, of hysteria. Um, and then in uh, the 1920s, 30s, we took a little bit of a tangent, like we often do in medicine, and thought that uh, these eating disorders might be caused by endocrine reasons, like pituitary tumors, for example, threw a lot of hormone treatments at them that didn't work, and then uh, uh, before too long realized we were barking up the wrong tree and kind of came back on track to uh, the course of understanding and study we're, we're still on. Um, in the 1940s, there's a notable study, a landmark study that taught us a lot about the psychological effects and physical effects of restrictive eating and starvation. It wasn't an eating disorder study, it was a study designed to understand what would happen if uh, people were taken as prisoners of war and were not fed well. So uh, a researcher named uh, Ansel Keys out of University of Minnesota recruited uh, conscientious war objectors. Uh, they said, if you don't want to go to war, then how about you participate in this study where they put them on a reduced calorie diet, say 1,500 kcal per day, bread, turnips, potatoes, uh, had them walk 
uh, 22 miles a week. And they, of course, uh, quickly began to drop weight. But, but really uh, uh, intriguing was what happened to their mood, energy level. Uh, they became irritable, depressed, lost joy in many things, um, and just had an overall mental deterioration. Some became obsessed with food, collecting recipes, dreaming about food. One uh, individual stopped at, I think, like 40 soda shops on his way home one day on one of these long walks. And it took them a long time to bounce back from this. So it's a study that would not be approved nowadays, but that we, uh, we can learn a lot from. And uh, just a note on body image. Uh, and I show these pictures through the ages of how body image has changed through culture. Um, not to say that, uh, not to place any blame on any of these eras or icons in body image, but to just point out that there has been work to do in body image uh, through the ages. Um, in the 1800s, this is, I think, a Renoir painting uh, that shows at that time, body image was focused on the ability to bear children. In the 1950s, we think uh, Marilyn Monroe is an icon of, uh, of like attainable realistic body image, but uh, in fact, she had her own struggles. And then um, same goes for Twiggy. She gets blamed for a lot of, uh, of body image issues. And she did say she would limit herself to one pudding a day. This is Twiggy in the 1960s. Um, but she also said at other times she would just eat, uh, quote, like a horse, uh, as she would put it, and was unable to gain weight, uh, which points out that uh, just because someone's skinny doesn't mean they're uh, doing it on purpose. Or even that term skinny is just, uh, is just a loaded uh, judgmental term. Uh, Kate Moss, in this 2008 picture, is famous for her quote, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. And she did say uh, a decade later, pretty recently, that she regrets that comment and was under a lot of pressure at the time and understands uh, that 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 can be uh, really harmful. And the picture that's not shown up here in 2019 above Cardi B over, over in the bottom corner was a Kim Kardashian picture. And it is a new era we're in with the coming of social media and uh, these powerful little devices in our pocket that uh, we spend so much time on. There was a study in 2017 out of Australia that showed that 30 minutes on Instagram can absolutely wreck your body image. And think about uh, the young people, all people, <laughs> who spend much more time on Instagram and platforms like that and what toll that is taking on our mental health. And uh, also the influence that not only celebrities have, but we all have on those in our circle by the things we say and our relationship with food and body. Um, but bottom line is I think uh, there, is, there is diversity in our bodies and that's a beautiful thing. Whether we're a size zero or size 22, we all have work to do in body acceptance, kindness, and on our way to, to loving ourselves. And just a couple little examples of that. You've got um, celebrities as the new diet, fitness, and health gurus, which is an interesting phenomenon. We, we measure our, our gurus by their uh, influence and following and status and not by their research credentials, uh, degrees, uh, etc. So you have folks like uh, Gwyneth Paltrow saying uh, you should be at your leanest livable weight or Jack Dorsey, uh, CEO of Twitter, uh, preaching this uh, way of living on one meal a day. And, there, and we'll see in a few slides that many, those who have a genetic predisposition to disordered eating, if they embark on an on a endeavor like that, it can be very, very dangerous. So let's, uh, let's move on. You can look at these on your own. Um, to sum up, so far, your body's not a problem to be solved. And we do need to make this much needed shift in paradigm from the body as a billboard to a body as our home and uh, from a focus on our weight to a focus on health and moving for pleasure and not punishment. Because we, we are in this culture, as we know, that 
almost prescribes eating disorder behaviors. Uh, when you walk into a doctor, your cholesterol might be high. BMI might not be this uh, textbook uh, range. And what do many uh, healthcare practitioners do? Prescribe dieting. And, and we know from uh, piles of research that uh, diets just don't work. Uh, people regain the weight and then some, and that there's a there's a much uh, better balanced way to approach this, and that's why I like these principles of uh, health at every size, haze as we call it, that focuses on weight inclusivity, uh, health education, respectful care, eating for wellness, well-being, and life enhancing movement, and I'd encourage you to check that out on your own. So a word on gluten, and we'll get into the first uh, uh, quiz question. I'm going to point them out as we go, just so you have those those handy and can uh, bust it out really easily. I don't want to make the quiz a difficult thing at all. Um, so Gwyneth Paltrow, again, not to uh, villainize her at all, but she, she has been preaching gluten-free, as the Kardashians have, and... Uh, you have others like uh, Jennifer Lawrence who are calling them out on that and a uh, 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 much needed uh, backlash or more balanced view of, of this issue because if you look at the numbers, and this is where we have a test question, test question number four is about gluten. Um, there are really only about 1% of Americans who have uh, legitimate diagnosed uh, celiac disease but for some reason, nearly 20% of us buy gluten-free food. 30% of us say they want to eat less gluten. Uh, and I put in here only 14% on gluten-free diets were told by a doctor they should stop eating. But still, that's a lot of people. A lot of people are told by doctors to stop eating gluten when there isn't a legitimate re reason. In fact, I was at a doctor uh, a number of months ago just talking about a family history of of uh, Alzheimer's, and the doctor busted out one of these books by uh, Perlmutter and uh, and said, oh, have you thought about gluten-free? And I just, uh, you know, my jaw dropped because if you look at other books by that author, uh, they're diet books, and it's part of this, uh, this diet and gluten-free craze that is not well-founded. I mean, sure, there there is legitimate celiac disease, of course, and there even are some non-celiac gluten-sensitive folks, but it does not account for this explosion in gluten-free products that is not uh, harmless either. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second, but this is just uh, a little picture I like showing what might happen if uh, Jesus were alive today and how that would go if he were spreading some bread and fishes around. So gluten-free dieting. Uh, we talk about the placebo effect as a, a positive thing. We'll take benefit in an antidepressant, for example, wherever we can get it. Part of that benefit from the medicine, part might be from a hope, a belief in the medicine uh, working that can enact real changes in neurotransmitters and real effects as well. But there's another side of that coin, whereas if we feel like something might harm us, it's more likely to produce those kind of effects. And that um, seems to be uh, part of what's going on with this uh, gluten-free dieting uh, craze. And over on the right here, I point out one study that shows that um, not only do gluten-free diets cost more money, but uh, they can also lead to uh, negative health consequences, um, such as from not getting enough grain, protein, etc. cetera. Um, so, and this is a real thing, by the way. Uh, Gluten-free dating sites really exist, apparently. Um, a quote I like, perhaps the biggest tragedy of our lives is that freedom is possible, yet we can pass our years trapped in the same old patterns. We may want to love other people without holding back, to feel authentic, to breathe in the beauty around us, to dance and sing, yet each day we listen to inner voices that keep our life small. All right, we're switching gears here to uh, what is happening in the brain in eating disorders. And still a lot of work to do in this area, but uh, a few things to point out is that eating disorders are not a choice. Someone might make a choice to uh, diet or restrict one day, but 
very quickly they can become they they do become deeply ingrained habits and uh, bigger than the individuals uh, and more difficult than anyone's ability to just pull themselves out by willpower especially from that brain that got them stuck in the first place uh, this is an interesting study back uh, a few years ago where they put some individuals with anorexia and some uh, non eating disorder control participants in a fMRI scanner functional MRI and asked them to rate these foods beforehand on if they think they're healthy if they think they're tasty and then uh, in the scanner they were asked to choose between them and I won't uh, go into the details but the bottom line is that individuals with anorexia when presented with a food choice uh, in the scanner they showed a different brain response that was more consistent with automatic habits. Uh, they weren't choosing uh, to eat super healthy food. The brain was on autopilot slipping into those choices uh, unconsciously right there in the scanner into this uh, deeply ingrained habit of restrictive eating. Um, and I'm going to skip through some of these but uh, and, and I'll point out when we hit a test question. But when we're normally when we're hungry there's food is more rewarding but in individuals with a predisposition to anorexia and after uh, getting anorexia as a, an example of some brain changes in eating disorder there's less reward sensitivity when exposed to food even when hungry even when you haven't eat, eaten as much and so the reward pathways are less sensitive to eating and therefore it's one of the things that can uh, contribute to the risk of, of getting an eating disorder and then to further complicate things when we lose weight say we embark on a diet and want to lose weight from the belly for example uh, we don't just lose weight from the belly in fact the brain as the fattiest organ in the body takes the biggest hit and uh, so there are traits that exist before eating disorders uh, that are risk factors and then things that come after the onset of eating disorders or worsen from malnutrition that uh, uh, make treatment and recovery even more difficult. We'll talk about some more of those. But uh, let's see, one, one thing I like to point out is that eating disorders, because we all need to work on this issue, eating disorders receive inadequate research funding. Uh, it's, it's way out of proportion to the prevalence of the 30 million people in our country who uh, suffer from an eating disorder. Um, the research dollars just do not keep pace with uh, the prevalence of other conditions, uh, even in uh, mental health. And part of this, I think, is from the fact that drug company pipelines have medicines in their pipeline for Alzheimer's, for schizophrenia, so others are making drugs for those targets but there aren't currently approved or recently approved medications for many eating disorders and there aren't uh, big pipelines and big research dollars and sadly that does seem to spill over into NIH funding, academic research and, uh, and therefore what options we have to help, our, to help our loved ones and those we work with um, in this field. So, Moving on from that to some comorbidity issues in eating disorders. Uh, it's rare to see an eating disorder in isolation. I think that would be, uh, that would not be the norm. Most, uh, most commonly there's another mental health con condition that either comes alongside it or uh, was there even before. Um, depression being the most common anxiety seen in at least half of eating disorders and this does vary based on type of eating disorder so in uh, anorexia nervosa for example you would have uh, say 20 to 30 percent of individuals with comorbid OCD and uh, whereas in bulimia nervosa you might have some more of the mood disorders and the substance abuse as you can see in the bottom there's a comparison on, uh, on substance abuse uh, conditions and uh, I like to take a step back or try and take a, a bird's eye view of these conditions sometimes and put them on a spectrum. Uh, like what if we take time out of the equation? If uh, depression is somewhat of a regret about the past, anxiety, worrying excessively about the future, what if you take out that tense 
and oversimplify things and look at things on a spectrum of uh, chaos to control, uh, disorder to uh, over control. You could see, you'd see anorexia, OCD up on the sp spectrum of rigidity. Uh, some brains are too locked, too rigid, some brains too loose, like on the psychosis uh, as a far end of the spectrum. And in treatment, uh, our work is often uh, swinging the pendulum back towards a balanced place in the middle. And uh, some would, would view that the ego structures or from a neuroscience standpoint, the default mode network uh, controlling uh, what we've got to do, the things we, we need to do, where we need to be, how we view ourselves and others, uh, that can just be too locked and too rigid in many of these conditions. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, there's a loss of control, like in binge eating disorder, of uh, unable to uh, refrain from uh, binge episodes or binge purge cycles in the example of bulimia. And and then our work is uh, bringing the pendulum more towards the middle. Um, so a word on genetics, and we'll get into uh, another test question here. This is test question number one about the heritability. We talk about nature versus nurture. There's been this age-old debate, but, you know, I don't think it's a debate. I think it's always nature and nurture. And the question is more of how much nurture and how much nature. Um, and there's a saying that uh, does sum it up pretty well, that genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. And uh, these are my identical twins, by the way. Um, Ten years old now, and they, they weigh, they uh, look different. They have different personalities. They have the exact same DNA. They're not the same weight. They're the same height. They have cowlicks on different sides of the head. But uh, it's just so neat to see that genetics uh, is not the entire picture. And we're, we are all made up of every experience, both in utero and throughout our whole lives, that got us to the point we're at today. And uh, uh, it's not just our genetics, not just our temperament, but there's a whole other part of the equation. Uh, here is a list of the heritability estimates, and your question number one asks about uh, what's the heritability estimate of eating disorders? And they are they are almost always up there above 50%, meaning 50% of the risk is uh, attributable to genetics and the rest from other factors like environmental influences. And it does depend on, it does differ among eating disorders and other uh, mental health conditions, and you can see more details in this table from a nature paper over to the side. Um, and those with a predisposition to restrictive eating, like we were saying earlier, uh, when they embark on a diet, it doesn't look like a typical diet curve of lose some weight and regain it. Uh, an individual at risk for anorexia, for example, might embark on a diet and have a very different curve where weight just drops beyond this point of, uh, of uh, healthy, uh, healthy body status and ability to bounce back from that, uh, requiring some very intense uh, and hard work, intense treatment uh, from lots of disciplines, as we see in this field. Um, so this uh, part I'm going to mostly skip over, but I think it's there's this paper that says when good traits go bad that I think is a really nice description of the issue because the individuals we work with in this field are often have these extremely uh, these extremely awesome traits of sensitivity, uh, very smart, capable, and uh, empathetic ability to stick to their their goals. Um, but those kind of things like perfectionism, as an example, can uh, get out, out of control under the perfect storm of genetic, uh, societal, environmental influences and certain life stressors. Um, and so when, when these good traits do go bad, they can turn into disordered eating. And uh, some kids are more sensitive than others. There was this... Uh, paper describing orchid children versus dandelion children uh, with the premise that both are be equally beautiful, but one 
has more of an ability to survive under any or thrive under any condition, like a dandelion, whereas an orchid being highly sensitive to the environment uh, is uh, very much at risk if uh, the conditions um, are changed or less optimal. And, and we do, I think that does resume, resonate with me in what we see in many individuals who do develop eating disorders. And this is the scale they use to, uh, to gauge that, and I put the cutoffs below. Um, so this uh, I'm going to skip over, but here's another test question for you. I think this is uh, question number, here I'll get it in a second. Uh, test question number six about anxiety and anorexia. That there, there is, uh, in anorexia as an example, there's comorbid anxiety disorders like generalized anxiety, OCD, panic disorder, there's an increased intolerance of uncertainty, meaning uncertainty is uncomfortable. There's increased harm avoidance, and there is increased pre-male anxiety leading to that restrictive eating. And uh, the clinical expression of that is avoidance of food, avoidance of, of some of these uh, situations that cause anxiety and the work involved in recovering from it. And here's uh, another question for you. This one is about the neurocognitive changes that happen during eating disorders. So there are temperament uh, predispositions, like genetic risk of eating disorders with certain traits, like increased anxiety. But then in the face of malnutrition, whether it's uh, anorexia, bulimia, or ARFID, or some other eating disorder, when the brain is not well nourished, there's more rigidity, there's less cognitive flexibility, there's less of an ability to see the forest from the trees, to shift from uh, staring at one's plate um, when working on a meal plan to seeing the big picture of one's hopes and dreams and trying to uh, remember the goal of uh, getting back to getting back on track in life or school or whatever they may be. Um, so weak central coherence, impaired cognitive flexibility, and uh, less uh, control over inhibitions and impulses. Oh, and this is an interesting one. Let me see if you can see it. Yeah. So this is a pile of coffee beans where there's someone's face hidden in there. And take a moment and stare at this pile of coffee beans and just see if you can find it's a man's head. And see if you can see it. I don't know if you can see my mouse at all, but if you're looking at your screen, it's in the bottom left quadrant of this coffee bean picture. Uh, and uh, once you see it, you can't unsee it. But this is uh, just an example of that central coherence issue where an individual with a certain type of eating disorder might see that face in the coffee bean pile more readily and be unable to shift back to the the bigger picture, like seeing the pile of coffee beans, going back to seeing where the, the face is. Uh, it might take us longer, you know, if, if we're not in a malnourished state or in an eating disorder kind of neurocognitive state, it might take us longer to see this guy's head, but uh, then we can shift back and see the pile of coffee beans again. Um, all right, so just to sum up, people don't choose eating disorders. No one wakes up and says, I'd like to have an anorexia. If they do, they're grossly misinformed and because uh, eating disorders are not a choice. They're serious biologically based illnesses and they are well intended. The, the reason someone develops an eating disorder and keeps it are very different things. Uh, they don't choose to get it or keep it. Uh, they might set off on a diet or exercise regimen and uh, they might be at risk and not know it, and before long it can become a deeply ingrained subconscious pattern that just takes a life of its own, uh, especially in the perfect storm of these uh, biopsychosocial risk factors. And in fact, uh, we can take a sec and look at one of these test questions that was on uh, number seven, precipitating biopsychosocial factors in eating disorders include 
all of those things. Early puberty, exposure to restrictive eating, dieting, or even excessive food, like food for emotional purposes, using food to self-soothe. You know, food is, is the first thing we're ever taught to self-soothe with. Fall off your bike as a kid, uh, here's an ice cream cone. We're, we're taught to eat our emotions, and, and uh, as parents, we don't think about the consequences of that, or at least we didn't in the past, uh, but that can uh, create a pattern of turning to, to food for, uh, in, you know, emotional reasons as well. Um, poor self-esteem leading to self-definition via body weight, which I think is getting worse these days with social media and then social pressure, body-focused activities like if participating in uh, cheer, ballet, uh, long-distance running, etc. Um, so part of the work is uh, uncovering the meaning behind these these uh, as a window to the struggling soul. What is the underlying issue and what healing needs to happen to help someone uh, really recover from this? So a few a few words on prevalence. Uh, we mentioned this number: 30 million Americans suffer from an eating disorder in their lifetime, and climbing. Uh, this is really high in certain uh, subgroups of the population. Um, eating disorders being the third most common chronic illness among adolescent females. But they don't discriminate. Males and females, young and old, all ethnic groups and economic classes are at risk. And here's some uh, prevalence numbers. Maybe 1% of American women will suffer from anorexia in their lifetime, 1.5% bulimia, up to 3% uh, binge eating disorder, and uh, add these up, and there's quite a quite a high lifetime prevalence. And this is just a table that you can review more on your own if you'd like, looking at kind of a differential diagnosis of uh, weight-related illness, uh, whether it's weight loss from physical illness or famine-induced, how these differ in their presentation, or how it might look in psychosis or autism spectrum conditions or in OCD that does not include a full-blown eating disorder. Um, and uh, just a summary as well of what, what has... Uh, transpired in moving from DSM-4, our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual version 4, to DSM-5 that uh, came out a number of years ago that has added binge eating disorder, for example, has moved uh, eating disorder NOS to um, OSFED, other eating disorders, just uh, semantics for the most part, but there have been some some changes that are worth, uh, worth noting. Um, but overall, in, in, as we get into treatment considerations, there's a stigma, there's a bias. We need to work hard to reframe this and to educate those around us. We also need a sense of urgency because we don't act quickly enough. The quicker we get uh, a treatment team on board, the sooner recovery will occur, the better chances the individual has at full recovery. So it's really... Uh, frustrating in, in this field and in the insurance industry specifically uh, when someone comes in they might have missed uh, one or two menstrual cycles we don't say why don't you come well insurance might tell us why don't you come back for treatment when you've missed more or when you've lost X number of pounds we'd never dream of saying that if someone gets say stage one cancer we don't say come back when your cancer is at stage two or three these are serious conditions and immediate care is needed so don't we don't need to wait until full medical workup is done because the first line of treatment is eat um, you might say to a family member we're still waiting for thyroid tests celiac tests but the most common reason that your child may be having these symptoms is an eating disorder and and we need to uh, proceed uh, proactively with treatment, especially uh, nutrition. So I'll, I won't uh, go over the diagnostic uh, considerations too much. I do want to point out uh, one of our test questions, uh, two of them, eight and nine, are about uh, FDA-approved treatments for eating disorders. There is no FDA-approved treatment for anorexia in terms of medications. Uh, one of the questions tries to trick you um, by 
saying Vyvanse for anorexia. That, of course, is not the case. Vyvanse is the most recent approved treatment for any eating disorder, and it's approved for the treatment of binge eating disorder. We'll talk about that. Uh, there is an FDA-approved treatment for bulimia, and that's been around a while. That's Prozac in reducing the binge purge cycles. And part of the problem is that with those medicines uh, is that there isn't an incentive for uh, a company to go study other antidepressants or other medications uh, like Prozac in bulimia, for example, because those medicines have been around a while. And practically speaking, in clinical practice, we interchange them. You might use Prozac for some, Zoloft for others, even though uh, it's Prozac with that FDA approval. Um, just a note on the diagnostic criteria, the big thing that differentiates anorexia from the other conditions is just uh, refusal or inability to maintain weight at or above what would be considered minimally healthy. It used to be by uh, percentage, now it's by BMI, uh, how we rate severity. And there's the heritability, again these heritability estimates are up there over 50%. Um, Here's a growth chart of, of someone with anorexia where you see their height on track, but then all of a sudden, if you see weight drop off like that, uh, you want to catch and intervene before it gets down to where it does in this example. And uh, another test question to point out here is uh, number three. One of the most common and effective treatments for eating disorders is family therapy. Family therapy... Families are the best allies for treatment, and especially in the young people, but even in adults, uh, you need to bring out all the psychosocial support you can in helping individuals recover from these. Um, even though there are no FDA-approved uh, medications for treatment of uh, anorexia, there are things we'll use uh, both for the, the core symptoms and uh, roadblocks and obstacles in treatment, but also for the comorbid issues. So if someone comes in to treatment already having a known uh, anxiety disorder or OCD, they might already be on an SSRI. Uh, they might already be on Prozac or Lexapro or something like that. And that's great. Sometimes they've never had treatment for this uh, because there is, uh, especially in this condition, uh, a resistance to medication. And, uh, you know, that fear of, of side effects that might be heightened. Um, but medications can be important treatments. One thing to point out, and this is question number 10 on your quiz, is antidepressant medications like SSRIs, like Prozac, Zoloft, are thought to be less effective when malnourished. And that doesn't mean we won't, we won't use them early in the process if needed, especially if someone's stuck but you can't really judge their effectiveness uh, until someone is well on their way during weight restoration um, for a number of reasons, but one simple one is just because uh, you need the nutritional building blocks of neurotransmitters to affect those with medications, and uh, that's why some basic nutrition and, and weight restoration is a top priority in treatment. But sometimes uh, the anxiety is just too high when faced with a meal plan, and sometimes anti-anxiety medicines like benzodiazepines are needed temporarily to facilitate the very difficult exposure work in the dining hall of a treatment center, for example, or at home uh, carefully with uh, family and other support as allies. Um, sometimes we'll use second generation antipsychotics. It's, a, it's an interesting name for a medicine because they started out in schizophrenia, then got approval for bipolar and, and many for treatment resistant depression as well. But these medicines can help uh, increase appetite, some of them can, decrease uh, rigid thought patterns and uh, some of that resistance to eating and gaining weight and uh, can facilitate the process of weight restoration. They might just be needed temporarily like benzodiazepines, but can play an important role, and there is some data to support that, as you can see in this table off to the side. It's hard to read here, but you can uh, pull these slides, download them, or uh, access that link, and take a look at the references. 
So moving on to, uh, I'll skip over ARFID, um, but moving on to bulimia, there's a question number eight that uh, says, which is true regarding bulimia? And I'll just tell you that uh, question A, binge purge is often used to re relieve stress or anxiety is is the answer on that one and it's true males are not more affected than females uh, this does occur in kids and later in life and uh, they by definition do not have a extremely low BMI in fact that's the differentiating thing between anorexia and bulimia one of the big ones is uh, anorexia is that inability to maintain a healthy body weight but uh, bulimia does not have that. Bulimia, the severity is measured by a number of these type of episodes per week. Uh, whether it's, uh, per, there are different ways of, of purging. That could be by self-induced vomiting, by misuse of laxatives, by diuretics, by excessive exercise. Um, and uh, medications in bulimia, as I mentioned before, and this is a test question as well, Prozac is the only FDA-approved medication for the treatment of bulimia, and its indication came around reducing the number of binge purge cycles, so that's how they measured efficacy. And while Prozac has that indication, the other ones in that class are thought to be uh, equally useful, uh, like uh, Luvox, Luvox that we've mentioned here uh, is really is really good at the obsessive compulsive uh, comorbidities or some of the rigid thoughts. Uh, Zoloft has some advantages because of its approval for use in children and adolescents like uh, like Prozac has. Uh, tricyclic antidepressants uh, are less commonly used because of the sedation, dizziness, and uh, they can be dangerous in overdose. Um, Lamictal could be useful in uh, emotional instability. Um, and uh, there, as you may know, if you've worked with this medicine, there's a rare chance of a severe rash to be aware of, and dosing needs to be approached slowly. Topamax is uh, one to be careful with in uh, eating disorders, especially uh, anorexia and bulimia because of its appetite suppression. Same with stimulants. And here's a, a look at uh, Prozac for uh, reducing the binge purge cycles. You can look at that on your own in this slide. Um, a note on binge eating disorder, because it does have, it's the newest eating disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and uh, also has the newest FDA-approved uh, medication, which we'll talk about in a second. But binge eating disorder is characterized by by these episodes of binge eating where there's loss of control and eating an abnormal, abnormally large amount of food in a short period of time and uh, feelings of guilt and shame afterwards. Um, and it does not have the purging uh, seen in bulimia and sometimes seen in anorexia. And it's the most uh, common eating disorder and still with the heritability estimate that's up there. This is a screening tool that you can think about um, in uh, detecting this called the BEDS. And that is uh, one of the test questions, I believe. Uh, there's one on binge eating. Number two is that binge eating disorder is uh, associated with a sense of lack of control over eating during the episode. So in, in 2015, Vyvanse, which uh, was otherwise just approved for ADHD because it's a stimulant, became the first and only uh, FDA-approved medication to treat binge eating disorder, and that's because, in part due to its uh, appetite suppression, in part due to helping with impulsivity, um, but it has some issues. It's not uh, trivial. It's a controlled substance, uh, can increase heart rate, uh, reduce appetite, keep you up at night, worsen anxiety in some cases. Um, we do use SSRIs, as we mentioned, uh, Prozac has that approval in bulimia to reduce binge per cycles, and it's thought to be helpful in binge eating as well. Um, and we'll sometimes use anti-addiction, anti-craving agents. But uh, I should point out that the gold standard in treating eating disorders uh, is therapy, is, uh, and that includes binge eating disorder where there is 
uh, CBT has the best evidence to support it. Sometimes medications like uh, Vyvanse are needed, and sometimes uh, other medications like uh, the last column here. And just a, a note on how long to treat. Some of these are temporary, very short-term med medicines for helping do the initial work, like benzos, because they're habit-forming and need to be used carefully. Um, if we're talking about treating someone's anxiety disorder, OCD, alongside with alongside uh, the uh, multidisciplinary treatment approach, sometimes those will be left on for years. But uh, as a as a general rule, and there's no right answer to this, I'll, uh, I like to treat with these medicines as long as they're helpful and not harmful, as long as the benefits outweigh the risk, until someone gets to a place of recovery and on solid ground where there aren't huge ongoing stressors or big risk factors or things coming up in life that might put them at risk. Uh, maybe get them for several months uh, through several months on their recovery path and then think about carefully getting off one of these medications. And just a, a note on what lies ahead or what's happening in psychiatry. Uh, because it is an interesting time. Uh, this year we have a few new FDA approved medications. Um, one of them that's interesting, not that relevant to what we're talking about, but uh, there was the most recent approval in psychiatry was a medicine called Brexanolone that is only given in hospitals for postpartum depression. Very expensive. It's an IV given over two and a half days uh, for a very unique subtype of depression that uh, previously didn't have uh, didn't have treatments. And you can uh, you can look at that on your own as as well as a history of antidepressants. A word on what else is happening in this space. Um, here's typical response rates on antidepressant. There's this study called STAR-D that showed uh, that antidepressants, each trial of an antidepressant, you might get 30 to 40 percent response by a single antidepressant. Placebo could be 20 percent plus. You do two trials of an antidepressant, you might be 50 to 60 percent um, over several months. Uh, it can be a frustrating process of trial and error. ECT, thought to be the gold standard in depression, uh, is effective in, I'd say the number's higher, 60 to 80 percent response rate. Um, and then along came, in the last decade, uh, a medicine from anesthesia that's uh, been really interesting uh, in psychiatry called ketamine. And then this year, we've had uh, a medicine hit the market called Spravato that is a modified version of ketamine called S-ketamine, uh, approved for treatment-resistant depression with uh, that's given in office. So it is it is a paradigm shift in psychiatry where it has to be given in an office setting. People need to be monitored for two hours after. They need to ride home. Uh, but it's rapid acting compared to traditional antidepressants that might take uh, that might take weeks to take full effect. This can happen within hours. And uh, I need to wind down in just a minute. Uh, for some questions, but here's what uh, here's what some of the data looks like when treating with these medicines um, in preventing relapse and uh, and in treating depression with uh, you know a lot more with a lot more of a fast acting and proactive approach. But uh, I'd love to uh, go over that more uh, if if there were time, but I'm going to wind it down and see what questions we have. Just a note as I as I wrap up is that uh, full recovery is possible. That's the, uh, that's the belief we operate from here at Center for Change, is, and that's the goal. And that, uh, you know, everyone, uh, everyone can, uh, can recover from these, even, e even though it's hard, even though it can be painstaking. It's kind of like, uh, physical therapy after an injury. It takes time. You may not see the benefits uh, day to day, but, uh, but full recovery is, uh, is the goal. And one quote to end on, hope begins in the dark, the stubborn hope that if you show up and try to do the right thing, the dawn will come. You wait and watch and work. You don't give up. And uh, 
Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear from you. There's my email and link to the slides as well. Dr. Robinson, we have many questions, more than we can answer in this time period. So I'll pick a couple, um, and then um, I can give you the rest. Maybe we can have you we'll, we'll do a, maybe a blog or something along those lines at some point. Yeah, answer sounds those good. Questions. That sounds good. Okay, so I'll pick a couple. The first one is thoughts on ketamine. Is weight needing to be fully restored before taking? Yeah, it's a good question, one we've thought about here. So at Center for Change, we did a, a pilot study of this uh, medicine. We had an IRB-approved protocol um, earlier this year, did a careful trial of ketamine for treatment-resistant depression in the eating disorder population, and uh, just realized it's going to take more numbers to answer that question. We just don't know if the same applies. I think in general, uh, the simple answer would be yes, these medicines, ketamine included, will work better after some weight restoration has taken place. But do they, could they have a potential role in facilitating that process or helping someone get unstuck early on? Yes, I think so. I think there, there could be careful use early in the process for some people. Great. Next question is, I know that many eating disorder treatment centers require patients come off Vyvanse for BED in order to approach treatment from increased rather than dulled interoceptive awareness sampling. Your thoughts? Yeah, that's a really interesting one. Uh, you know, I often think of it from the other, the other side of the equation in that in a treatment center, uh, whether it's day treatment or 24-hour care, Vyvanse uh, isn't often uh, useful because in a structured environment you can't really judge its effectiveness on reducing the binge number of binge episodes and it's more helpful on an outpatient basis uh, what it does to interceptive awareness is a good question I think uh, it really depends on the individual if someone is so uh, like if there's comorbid ADHD someone's so distracted it can potentially hone in on things it could have the opposite effect on others uh, we don't here at Center for Change, we don't require people to come off of it coming into treatment, but uh, we do take a careful look at it and make sure it's not a roadblock or impediment to recovery. But uh, yeah, I would be happy to chat with you more about that one. It's a, it's a good question that uh, takes a little longer to, to talk through. Thank you. Okay. I often run into trouble with clients who have negative body images getting advice from their doctors to lose weight. I'm not a medical professional, so how can I help the client deal with this without overstepping my role? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a problem out there for sure. Uh, I mentioned my experience uh, with doctor's offices and running into some of these issues, and uh, I think we just need to spread the word of positive uh, body image, health at every size. I would look up Hayes principles and just spread the word of health uh, inclusivity from that Hay standpoint. It's a really, uh, it's a really solid and uh, wi increasingly widely accepted uh, stance on the matter that uh, I think is worth taking a close look at and joining that movement if uh, it resonates with you. Thank you, Dr. Robison. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We recognize that it, it, many of you have uh, sessions to get to, so we'll wrap up here quickly in the last couple of minutes. Just some final um, notes. If you missed our, our disclaimer at the beginning, I'll reiterate it again, which is when we stop the webinar here shortly, you'll have a pop-up that um, is a, our survey questions from the presentation today. If you'd be so kind as to just take one minute to complete that survey, that would be really helpful for us. That is a continuing education requirement our, on our end. All of that information is anonymous, and then we gather that anonymous information and have to send it to our CE certification folks. So if you'd please take that, that would be great. That is completely separate from the post-test. So the, in order to receive credit for this presentation, you have to have um, 
attended in its entirety. Uh, and in about an hour or so, you will receive a separate email with a link in that email to take the online test. You click on that link and it will take you to the test site. You take the online test there, pass it 80% or better. And once you do that, then your certificate will be automatically generated from the test site. If you don't see it at the bottom of your screen, check your downloads file. Sometimes it ends up going in there. Um, I think that's it for today. Thank you so much again for joining us. We appreciate your, your attendance and we hope to see you, have you with us again uh, in a couple of months when we do our next one. Thanks so much.